911, what's your emergency? Um, my daughter, I woke up this morning and she's not in her bed, she's missing. She's eight years old. Has she ever left before? No, never. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Kirsten and all those affected by this dark case. Kirsten Hatfield, a vibrant soul, entered the world in 1989 in Midwest City, Oklahoma. She was affectionately known as Curdle Birdle. Kirsten's youthful spirit radiated with a zest for adventure and the thrill of life's exciting moments. She was a true enthusiast, finding joy in roller coasters, of climbing trees and competitive games of horseshoes. Kirsten's love for life and her family was unmistakable, even at the tender age of five when her baby sister Faith was born. She formed a protective and unbreakable bond with Faith fostering a family connection that promised a life filled with fun, togetherness and security. Kirsten cherished her home as a sanctuary, where she could revel in the warmth of her family's love and the simple joys of everyday life. By the age of eight, she was attending the second grade at Traub Elementary School. There, Kirsten's infectious spirit touched the lives of all those fortunate enough to be around her. Midwest City is situated in central Oklahoma, which is in, if you couldn't guess, the Midwestern region of the United States. One of the city's defining features is the presence of the Tinker Air Force Base. This is one of the largest military installations in the United States. It plays a vital role in the local economy and the community. Another feature of Midwest City is its reputation as a family-friendly community with a strong sense of safety and security. The area offers a range of amenities and services for families. This makes it overall an attractive place to live. The city hosts a variety of community events and gatherings, fostering a sense of togetherness among residents. These events include parades, fairs and festivals. Overall, Midwest City is a community with a strong family presence and family-oriented values. A place where no one would fathom a vicious crime occurring. On the night of May the 13th, 1997, Kirsten's mother Shannon performed her nightly ritual of tucking her beloved daughters into their beds. With Kirsten and Faith settled in, Shannon looked forward to a peaceful night's sleep, a night that could be filled with dreams of the life that they shared. However, the quiet of the night was soon disrupted by a subtle sound, an unsettling disturbance in the otherwise sleeping household. At around 3am, Shannon was awakened from her sleep by a soft whining noise. This was coming from the girl's bedroom. At first, Shannon attributed the sound to Faith. She had, after all, occasionally talked in her sleep. Trusting that her children were safe and sound, Shannon attempted to return to sleep. Yet a feeling of unease lingered, and something didn't sit right. In response, she rose from her bed and made her way to the girl's bedroom. To her surprise, the bedroom door was closed. This was different from the norm. Typically, Kirsten and Faith slept with the door open just a crack, inviting the comforting hum of the house into the room as they slept. Mother Shannon gently pushed the door open and returned to her bed without going inside not realising that this seemingly innocent event would mark the beginning of a mystery, one that would haunt her for years to come. When the sun rose over Midwest City the following morning at around 6am, Shannon went into Kirsten's bedroom to wake the girls up. As she stepped into her daughter's room, she made a heart-wrenching discovery. Although Faith was in the room, Kirsten was nowhere to be found. Shannon's immediate response was a surge of panic and distress. 
Desperation guided her frantic search as she darted back and forth between the neighbouring houses, her voice carrying pleas for help and calls for her missing daughter. She scoured every nearby area that she could, searching for any sign of her dear Kirsten. Eventually, after an agonising but fruitless search of the surrounding area, Shannon returned to her home. The mother then desperately dialed 911, setting in motion a huge citywide investigation. 911, what's your emergency? Um, my daughter, I woke up this morning and she's not in her bed, she's missing. She's eight years old. Has she ever left before? No, never. My three-year-old was crying, the door was shut. I just went and opened it. I didn't even, I didn't even look to see there. And then I went back to bed. <laughs> Investigators from the Midwest City Police Department would soon arrive at the anxiety-ridden home on Jet Drive. Their search for clues began almost immediately. A missing child is one of the most time-sensitive cases that there is. Police officers entered the house and swiftly began searching, looking for any sign of where Kirsten could have gone, and what they found was chilling. The bedroom window, although closed, was unlocked, suggesting that an intruder might have entered or exited through it. Their focus then turned to the windowsill. There they discovered several spots of red fluid. This discovery immediately caused the investigation to intensify. Concerns for Kirsten's safety grew rapidly. The search extended into the backyard, and there a six-foot-tall wooden fence became the next point of interest. Here, officers found more traces of red liquid, further cementing the fear that Kirsten might have been the subject of harm, perhaps being injured as she was aggressively taken from her bedroom through the window. Investigators were deeply troubled. They realised the gravity of the situation that had occurred in this close-knit community. As the search continued, officers stumbled upon another crucial clue. Kirsten's underwear, tattered, torn, and lying amongst blades of grass in the backyard of the Hatfield home. This discovery, alongside the other evidence, deepened the sense of worry that something sinister had occurred the night before, bringing horror into the Hatfield home. Almost positive an abduction had taken place, law enforcement swung into action without pause. They reached out to local businesses, urging them to hand over any surveillance footage from that night. They lived in hope that they could identify the mysterious abductor and trace their movements. One piece of surveillance footage in particular caught their attention from a nearby convenience store. As they combed through the footage, they watched as a man entered the store. He asked the cashier about Jet Drive, the very same street where Kirsten and her family lived. This was the first lead that they had, but they had no idea where to begin in their search for this man. From the footage, they could glean a basic description, but nothing that could give them a solid direction to go in. Meanwhile, word quickly spread to the community that Kirsten Hatfield was now missing, and that this was an urgent case, time was of the essence. The urgency of her disappearance gripped everyone surrounding the Hatfields. They immediately clamoured round and began organising a search party. The assistance of the Heidi Search Centre from Texas was sought out to boost their efforts. Missing person flyers which described Kirsten rolled out onto the streets. These flyers described her as a young girl standing at 4 feet tall and weighing 55 pounds. A girl with deep brown eyes that matched her long brown hair. The outfit she was last seen wearing was a big adult sized white t-shirt. The flyer was complete with specific markers to look out for. This was such as the fact that she had discoloration on her neck and stuttered when she spoke too fast. The collective efforts of the community, law enforcement and dedicated search teams were all mobilised together in efforts to locate Kirsten. Volunteers combed the area tirelessly, but days continued to pass without any promising leads or developments. This situation had investigators perplexed. Their frustration only increased with each passing day. Captain Cecil Frymere, the lead investigator on the case, had no idea where to go next. The police force didn't have nearly enough leads or evidence to go in on one distinct direction, and new information was drying up. 
the evidence they had found at the scene was indeed helpful, but they had to patiently wait for the test results to return before they could do anything. The community and Kirsten's family anxiously awaited for a breakthrough, anything that could bring their beloved child back home and well. In the following week, the excitement of new evidence flickered. Some children's clothing was discovered near northeast Oklahoma City. The police force quickly made their way to the location to collect these items, hoping that they could perhaps be a clue or a lead in Kirsten's case. However, upon close examination, it was determined that these garments were not Kirsten's. This stifled the hopes of her mother and investigators, putting them back to square one. As June arrived, a month had passed since Kirsten had vanished from her bedroom. The Heidi Search Centre concluded its involvement in the search. However, Kirsten's mother and the rest of the Midwest City community refused to give up hope. They established a command post at Traub Elementary School, and they continued their search efforts in coordination with the Midwest City Police Department. The determined search team scoured every corner of the city, giving every ounce of dedication they had towards the cause. But these extensive searches yielded no evidence or leads, nothing new that could bring them any closer to finding Kirsten. Kirsten's mother Shannon was overwhelmed with gratitude as the community stepped up to help in finding her daughter. She thanked everyone for participating and giving their time in the search for Kirsten, saying that the tragedy that was occurring showed a community spirit that was unwavering in coming together to help. As the community continued to work together, investigators remained steadfast in their quest to identify the man who had inquired about Jet Drive at the convenience store. Described as a tall black man, approximately 6 feet 2 inches tall and weighing around 230 pounds, he was last seen wearing a blue and white striped shirt along with a matching baseball cap. With this description, police struggled to find any defining features or characteristics, nothing obvious that could help them narrow down the search for this man. Without anything else to go on, this lead too would grow cold. Weeks turned into months and Kirsten's absence persisted. Mother Shannon was exhausted and disheartened, but she refused to surrender her hope that her daughter would safely return. The passage of time never wavered her determination to find Kirsten. By July, the ground searches had ceased. It became evident that Kirsten was nowhere within the immediate area. They'd searched in lakes, patches of woods, parks and even on the Air Force Base. But there was absolutely no further trace of Kirsten. However, officers did not give up on a search for evidence, or the hope that at least one person had information on what could have happened to Kirsten two months before. The initial discovery of red fluid on the windowsill and the fence made the case even darker. Upon further testing, it was confirmed that this did not belong to Kirsten. Investigators began to shift their focus away from this evidence as any type of help in their case. They began to wonder where they could turn next. Shannon did her best to remain as honest as possible with officers throughout their investigation. She wanted to be clear regarding her behaviour during Kirsten's disappearance. She candidly admitted that she had been a user of illicit substances, insisting that she had never done it around her children and that she had only done it socially. She also acknowledged that her associations with others that used illegal substances could have potentially made her and therefore her daughter a target. Shannon admitted to the fact that she wasn't a perfect mother, saying that if her involvement with users was the reason why Kirsten was gone, then she was indeed guilty. Police had thought all along that Kirsten was abducted by someone close to her or her family in some way. This included relatives and any friends of the family, so therefore it included Shannon's less than upstanding friends. Their rationale was based on the idea that a stranger would likely have encountered difficulty in quietly carrying Kirsten out of the window and then over the fence without causing a commotion. Several people close to the Hatfield family, including other family members, underwent polygraph examinations and some of them even failed to pass. But these examinations did not yield enough evidence to bring charges against anyone. The lack of any definitive proof of what had occurred making the investigation almost impossible to solve. As the months turned into years, 
Kirsten's family grappled with the heart-wrenching absence of their daughter. Their lives were forever altered by the inexplicable void left by Kirsten's disappearance, burning with the knowledge that it would likely never be solved. Time had passed, but the questions surrounding her whereabouts continued to haunt them. Childhood photos of Kirsten were aged with technology. The idea of this was to reflect what she might look like now as a teenager and a young adult. However, no sightings would ever be reported. The community had begun to move on without Kirsten in their lives, and her family eventually did their best to follow. Lois Grigsby lives two doors down from where little Kirsten lived back in 1997. It brings tears to my eyes, you know, just uh, just, just even knowing that the, that the little girl had come up adopted, you know, out of that house. Not just heartache, but also fear for her own children. When she told me that, I literally took the air conditioner out of his window and nailed the window shut. A few doors down, Jennifer Meeks, new to the street and to motherhood, was shocked to hear her neighborhood's past. Oh my God, that's very scary. That's very scary because we got a little nine month old. Today, the search continues for the next tip, next sighting, next lead for the little girl who would be 26 today. She was never found, so it's possible she is still alive. Um, you know, different people have different feelings on that. In June of 2015, nearly 20 years after Kirsten vanished, a fresh perspective arrived when a new investigator joined the Midwest City Police Department. This diligent investigator, with the knowledge of the latest advancements in DNA technology, decided to review the cold case of Kirsten Hatfield. It became evident that there were critical pieces of evidence that had not been subjected to DNA testing, along with some other evidence that could benefit from re-examination using newer forensic tools. This breakthrough signalled a renewed hope for answers and for justice in Kirsten's case. With the case re-sparked by forensic technology, the new investigators at the police station decided to revisit everyone they questioned way back in the original case and request a DNA sample from each. One of these men was Anthony Joseph Palmer. He lived just two doors down from the Hatfields on Jet Drive. Investigators visited his home that he lived in with his now wife. He married her a short time after Kirsten's abduction. When questioned about his reactions to the case, Palmer's wife revealed that her husband still harboured strong emotions when the case was mentioned, saying that it was especially hard to deal with as she had disappeared so close to their home. When questioned about his involvement in Kirsten's disappearance, Anthony denied any wrongdoing and he did agree to provide a DNA swab for testing. Everyone they had questioned back in 1997 who had agreed to give a sample was swiftly tested against the DNA found on the windowsill and on the fence of Kirsten's home. The analysis of Anthony Palmer's DNA revealed an astonishing match with the DNA found at the crime scene. The probability of this match was estimated at 1 in 293 sextillion. This made it basically impossible to be anyone else's DNA. This proved that the new technology was exactly what officers needed to catch a break. Palmer's DNA was found to be a match on Kirsten's underwear discovered in the backyard, as well as on her bedroom windowsill. As a result of this compelling evidence that had finally been collected, Tony Palmer was arrested in October of 2015, marking a huge development in the case and a major step towards seeking justice for Kirsten. Tell you anything more. If I, I drink a lot of water. I had some stomach issues and the ducts I drink water. It really helps with the indigestion real bad. It's just chewing. I thank you for coming down here. Well, you know, as, it, as a state employee, you know, it's something we have to do. Well, we have to abide by all. Right. Well, we appreciate law enforcement and in, all that. And in, in here's where we're kind of bad. We're uh, we're still looking at the Kirsten Hatfield thing, and we're going back and we're talking to a lot of people and. I know over the years. You weren't there the first time, Dick Van Dale, were you? You know. No. Um, I was with Miller the, the last time that I was to talk to you about the other deal. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, over 17 years, I know in my life, I've changed a lot. 
And uh, so we wanted to talk to you about if you can kind of tell me 17 years ago how your life was, how that neighborhood was, what was going on in that neighborhood. I know I've talked, I've read some of the reports that uh, from the interviews before and how it appears to me that you, they call you Uncle Tony around there because you care about the kids. You were well, the yeah. Basically, Basically, when I moved nature. there, lived there, there was a bunch of older people. That was like a, I don't, not a no retirement place, but most of the people in that area were old retirees. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I being I like doing stuff all the time. You know, I was always outside, and if somebody's working on their vehicle, got to go be busy body, hey, you know, and help them, or somebody's washing machine was broke down. And the older people, you know, they can't. Night, older people, right. <laughs> you know, can't do stuff. And I've always been mechanically inclined, you know, where I could figure stuff out, you know, right. or help them move this or, you know, just, I've always been, I don't know about friendly, but neighborly. Right. And that being my first home, right. you know, I tried to make it where that neighborhood was my home. Yeah. Well, did you help any of the kids over there? Well, when the feed them pizza, yeah, I've stuff. always there's always that's you my Kool Aid house. Well, I don't know about Kool Aid. That's yeah. always been my pet peeve. Is I grew up hungry, you know, and I don't. There's a lot of kids hungry, yeah. you know, and I I, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, not where I'd go down my way. Hey, you hungry? But I mean, you see kids, you're over there eating something, and they're just right. You know, you see them draw. I can't stand that. You know, that's, that's one of the stories I, t I want to turn my phone off so people yeah, will leave me alone. Before oh, we get started talking. here, Tony, let me go ahead and I want to read your Miranda warning, okay? okay. Uh, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have him present with you while you're being questioned. Uh, if you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before any questioning if you wish one. And if you decide to make a statement, you can stop at any time. And do you understand each of those rights? I'll yes. explain to you. Having those rights in mind, do you wish to talk to us? Yep. Do you mind just initially kind of take us back to 1997 and go back over that, maybe that evening before and into that morning when all of it all kind of started blowing up? And just best you can tell us everything you remember. <coughs> And, and take your time. I know we're going back some some years. Yeah, I know. Starting to get that old timer stuff. But really, the only thing I can really remember is afterwards. You know, when you know, cause it it was just a, a typical day. You know, got off work, went home, had supper, watched TV, went out. Because used to <laughs> being a landscaper. My yard was my pride. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted to play in my yard because my yard was nothing but Bermuda. There I mean, I, had, <laughs> you know, I just had Bermuda grass. Sure. But I mean, not that they came over there, but that's what I did. I always, I always worked on my yard. Mm -hmm. and, and, and back then, you were, you said you were working at the Capitol? Yes. So, okay. So, you, you were very experienced at keeping the yard. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, uh, well, you know, got chemical losses off the gap and all that. You remember anything about the the day or evening before? You said it was just a typical day. You worked all day and then went home. You remember anything unusual about that evening that stands out to you? No, other than what I told them about, you know, seeing the white truck, you know, in front of their the white Chevy truck in front of their yard. Okay. You know, I, I like I said, I didn't I didn't have anything to do with those people. Didn't know them at all. You know, okay. it's not like I went, hey, yeah, you, you got your little girls? No, it wasn't like that. Okay. I was, usually I was outside working on my yard, you know, either talk to the neighbors or kid would come by, Tony, can you fix my bike? You know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like I'd tell them to come over or anything. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go to other people's houses unless, you know, I, I was needed or something like that. But everybody just got, oh, Tony, I'll fix your bike and blah, 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 you know. And I try to make it feel like, you know, that was kind of a safe place, you know, for, sure. you know. Because I had Tristy at the time. Uh, she wasn't there during that time. But I had Tristy there 
since she was, you know, small. And whenever she was there, you know, the kids would come and play with her. And now, who know, is Tristy? She know. was my, well, one of my girlfriend's daughters okay. that stayed with me a lot. Okay. So you, you had a good bond with Tristy, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Was she and her mom. So you never, I, I'm assuming you probably saw Shannon and Kirsten running around the neighborhood and so forth. To tell you the truth, until that happened, I I, I think I seen the kid one time. She was playing with uh, uh, Crystal that lived up the street. But I don't remember if it was in that time frame or what. I don't, I don't really know. Because I, like I said, I didn't pay no attention. Okay. Do you remember ever like giving food to Kirsten oh, or no. talking to Kirsten? No. Was she ever at your house? No. Anything like no. that? No. And do you remember? I'm kind of, I'm, I'm actually a leery guy until you know people start coming around. You know, I I just I'm not just oh yeah I'll be your friend. You know, no, not like that. Yeah. But I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't have. Don't didn't pay attention to you know who all was there or who they were. You know. And, Things like that in my world just fall in place. You know, we accidentally meet. Oh, okay. Yeah, now I know you. You know right. then, but no, never, okay. never. Do you ever recall helping Kirsten with her bike no. or anything? You don't no. remember any interactions with her no. at all. No, I know there wasn't any interactions. I didn't. I didn't know them at all. And I, just, like I said, I don't even know how long they've been living there until that happened. Okay. Because I was always me. That was back when I was fishing. I'd uh, just he'd come off of work. I'd load up my poles, go to Draper. And sometimes I'd stay there all night. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd always have, you know, second jobs, you know, after after hour jobs, mm -hmm. either landscaping or anything, anything to make a buck. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'm pretty sure that Detective Miller talked to you this before, but am I correct that you said you had never been over there mowing for Shannon or no, working on her property or? Okay. No. Seems like that that come up. Somebody thought you might have been mowing over there or something. No, well, he was asking the, if it's about something about a handyman. Is what okay. he was asking me about. Okay. Well, do you remember ever mowing over there no. or anything like that? No. Okay. Did, while they lived there, do you remember ever being in the yard, the front or backyard, no. for any reason? Okay. How about in the house? Nope. So there no, was never any time no. that Shannon asked for your help no. to fix this or that or mm -hmm. mow the yard for me or... Let, let me bounce back a little bit. We got off a little bit off track. Um, I was kind of having you go back over what you remembered. Through the night, uh, and I, I read over the, the FBI notes that they took when they talked to you. I guess there was some information about you hearing dogs barking. Yeah, I had a dog in the backyard. Dog, his name was Dog. About three or four o'clock in the morning, you went to raising hell. So I just, you know, really, believe it or not, in my neighborhood, we still got skunks and possums and stuff like that, plus other dogs, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why that woke me up, but because I usually didn't wake up, and and usually he's out inside anyway. But it woke me up, and he was barking at that back fence, at our back fence. But at the time, as you walk out my back door, I had an old apricot tree. So unless you went, went out there, you know, you couldn't see. And I just hollered at him because, you know, thinking it was another dog. or Because there was always, and traffic, there was human traffic back there. But usually yeah, there was other dogs, about. yeah. There was other dogs or cats. There was always animals through there. So I just, you know, I really didn't think nothing about it. I just hollered at him and he came in and I went back to bed. So you actually let him back into the yeah. house. Yeah. So you opened what your back door, I'm assuming, and let him in. Yeah. Did you go investigate? No. Did you look down the alley? No. Anything like that? No. Because usually in the past, whenever I did, that's what it was. Was you know either another dog or people use that alleyway, you know, to get through. Why I don't know. Because I mean, I don't know where you'd be going other than from house to house. But there was always, not always, but there was there was traffic. Okay. Um, and, and speaking of the alleyway, did you have any kind of a gate or anything that went out to it? So you didn't have access to it through your backyard? No. I, I mean, I, I think that would be, be ideal to be able to go out in the alley and you could back a trailer up and it just seems like everybody had a gate. Well, the house next door to me had didn't have a fence. 
So whenever I weed eat it or, you know, did whatever, because I always weed eat it, you know, two foot around from my fence, you know, next door and then that alleyway, which the alleyway was. Because I read your your uh, statement, you said you saw your gate ajar. Which gate was that? Gate ajar. Yeah. You didn't have a gate on the back or on the side? Did you have a gate on the side of that? Yeah, we got a gate. Well, it's... Yeah, it's a gate, but no, it wasn't on the door. Okay. It, it, anything else that night after you let dog back in, did anything else occur that you remember? No, I went back to bed, me and dog. Okay. And then when did you first become aware of uh, Kirsten was missing and all that was going on? Well, the next day there was all that activity, and I asked, neighbor across the street what was going on they said they couldn't find Kirsten and I didn't think nothing about it you know I went to work and then I, I don't remember if she called me or I called over there or what and they said they just want people back you know because they wanted to go to our houses and blah 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 so clocked out and came back home do you remember what time it was that no. you clocked out came back home no. was this morning was this afternoon it was uh probably mid-morning something like that now, who was the friend that you were communicating with? It was, um, and I don't, today, I don't know what her name is. Y'all showed me a picture of her. Okay. I think y'all showed me a picture of her. Anyway, of her husband, Don. Is this the Halseys, Tiffany Halsey and Don Halsey? I guess, you know? yeah. I'm not sure if, if, if Mr. Halsey is Don or not. Um, did you have well, Somebody had called me and said they was, they was, they, that we were wanted back at our house. Okay. So I, I came home. Okay. And then what happened? I just sat there. Did, did any yeah. of our officers or the FBI or anybody come by? It was an FBI. Yeah. Okay. They came in, took statements, you know, walked through the house and, you know, wanted to go in the backyard and, you know, because I had a shed back there. He wanted to look in the shed. And okay. So he did look through the house and yeah. look through the shed? Yeah. You probably don't remember who that was, I'm sure. No. Okay. And did he, was he just asking you general questions about Kirsten and did you know her, have you seen her, that kind of thing, or? Basically. Did you write out a statement for him or did he, no, was he just have a conversation? I thought he wrote out a statement. Okay. But he asked me if he'd come in, he wanted, you know, asked me what I knew, which at the time really wasn't anything. He wanted to, he said they was going through the neck, canvassing the neighborhood and, yeah. you know, asking mm -hmm. everybody and. Yeah. So, yeah. 17 years ago, Tony, were you experimenting with any drugs? No. You uh, never did? No. I drank beer. That's it. <laughs> Just drank I drank beer. I drank beer. But as far as drugs, no. Was Kirsten ever one of the kids that you had seen, or was there any talk in the neighborhood about her being mistreated or abused or in need? No, because like I said, I really I yeah. had no inkling that they even existed until after that until i didn't know that, yeah had never seen her anything maybe like once that. or twice and didn't think nothing about it you know just another kid yeah no no okay how about out i mean just generally like who were your friends best you can recall back then uh basically just people that i worked with okay up there at the capitol right. no no long lost pal from school or anything yeah I guess you moved off from New Mexico and left them there. Yeah. You? you know, I'm not the kind that goes to a bar. You know, if I'm not correct, I drink at home. I mean, I know I've, I've met a lot of people, but. So you, you would drink some, but didn't do any, didn't experiment yeah. with drugs, didn't do marijuana, anything? No. Did they drug test back, back in them days? At your work? Well, uh, they always hung that over on us, you know, but we never, we never had to got you a. Okay. So it was kind of the, the threat? Yeah. There was some others they would have. You ever had any trouble with the law on you? Oh, yeah. Before? Uh, years ago, first degree burglary and assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. I think I told your partner that. Really? Back when I was a dumb kid. How, how long ago was that? 
I was, I think they just turned 18. Oh, so you were just a boy. Yeah. And all about a, my girlfriend. Where was that at? Uh, Walters. Walters, Oklahoma. Oh, okay. Up in Cotton County? Yep. And you were when I got out of Job Corps, I, uh, they found me a job there in Walters as a diesel mechanic. Is that how you what your training was? I uh, actually I was training for auto job. mechanic, but they found me a job as a diesel mechanic and uh the counselor at Job Corps he made some deal with the government that if the government or if the employer would pay half the wages they would pay, you know, for right, OJT. Right. Uh-huh. So it was a pretty good deal. Yeah, it was. I'm surprised that diesel you didn't stay with that. Those diesel mechanics make some money. Yeah, yeah but it's hard work. I mean, it yeah. can be harder than weed eating. All yes, I can too. Some of the some of them parts weigh heads for uh, one of the burst styles was probably two hundred pounds, and you got you got a tire about that high, and you got to get it up on that, and get it you know on the block, and then you're torquing stuff at two hundred forty foot pounds, you know, laying on your back, and it's it's hard. In the last seventeen years, Tony, have you have you uh, changed much? Is this how you were seventeen years ago? Just a hard working man. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Okay. I've changed older wise, but you know. And and I'm not the same person I was seventeen years ago. I've matured a little bit and I wish, I wish I could say that. Life changes people, you know, as you get older you start recognizing things that you that you could handle differently than what you mm-hmm. if you had it to do over again you'd change, you know. I can Really yeah, but say that's that. the thing. We can't. We can't ever change it. Yeah. No, you can't change what happened, but sometimes you can make things better. I remember a few years ago, I went to my high school reunion, and I seen a kid that honestly, I just tormented to death. I made his, and I was able to find him and make amends. I make amends and apologize and tell him, I, you know that. I was immature at the time and asked for his forgiveness and you know I think it, by the end of he actually remembered some of the things I'd done and we talked about it and I I felt a lot better and I think he felt better at the end I know I did when he said he gave me some absolution some forgiveness hey I know you were just you weren't very mature back then and you know well, it's good for your self respect too it is it is but, to get it out, and I tell you what, the weight, and I don't know why God had put on me a burden of of guilt. Uh, I, I, want to say, I don't want to use the word guilt, but I really felt like uh, after I did that, I had a, a new outlook. You get to go fishing? Yeah. For a week? Yeah. Don't, don't I call it vacation. Because he like, because when he's gone, I <laughs> do whatever <laughs> it's, it's all right. It's my therapy. It's all right. Uh, actually, it is therapy. It's very good therapy. It is. Cause I'm like you. I work. I mean, that's all I ever known was to work. But now, my wife doesn't understand that working is therapy too, especially. If, well, I've always I've always suffered from depression back when I was a young kid. So, and that always seems like working. I guess gets your mind off of whatever it is you're thinking about, or you know, whatever. So. That's all I do is work. It gives you a sense of accomplishment, too. That's one thing we really... Well, especially when your, your, your folks tell you that you ain't worth a shit and you'll never amount to hell of beans and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I know. Showed I know. you, then. Is, <laughs> is that how you grew up in a tough environment like that? I just, that's a shame. I remember my dad, he never... I wrestled and went to state and dad never saw me wrestle. Uh-huh. You know, and I asked him about it one day, and because it bothered me year, for years, and he goes, "Well, I never discouraged you from doing it." Well, that hit you. And he goes, and I, he goes, "My dad would cause down there on the farm, Paul. He was a rough man. You know, he would browbeat those boys. So dad has progressed to. He's better than his father. Hopefully, I'm better than my father was as far as encouraging. Yeah, but that that telling you that he didn't discourage you, you know, because some uh, what for is you ain't never gonna you ain't gonna be worth a damn. Yeah, yeah, blah, 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 don't. That's wrong. Been there, that's done wrong. that. Yeah. And that affects you. Yeah. I mean, that stays with you for life. 
I, I'm always on my boy because my grandson's the greatest thing that walks the face of the earth. And I'm always on him, hey, you're too hard on that boy, you're too hard on that boy, you're too hard on him. And uh, so hopefully he, he's a better father than I am. He was, he is. So, but uh, I was very fortunate to uh, get to get some things off my chest over the years. And as I get older, I, uh, you know, my dad has even talked to me about things that he has wished he had redone, you know. Yeah, I think everybody has. My only, well, the only thing that really, and that's you're probably, probably getting completely off the deal, but when I left Walters, when I got in trouble with Walters, I was going out with an angel. I mean, it's a good woman, huh? My biggest mistake. Yeah, I fucked up big time. Did you? That's the only time I can really say that I fucked up. You lose your temper. Well, yeah, that's basically what it would have happened. You know, he was picking on her, and I had, like a dumb kid, had to go do something about it. You know? Well, not necessarily a dumb kid. Sometimes men got to do Well, that. now, you know, there's other ways of doing yeah. stuff, but. And of course, I've been drinking. Right. That's not the best uh, decision making no. process. Conducive to great decision making, believe me. I was telling my partner as we was driving that out to your work that uh, I was 16 years old and we cut school. And back then, that's where we we went drinking. Dirty bird. Dirty bird. And Do you ever lose any jewelry after? <laughs> no, but I put my Mustang in the ditch out there, and I shouldn't have. And I tried and to I was hide telling it. them I've probably found uh, 200 gold rings since I've been out there. Wow. wow. Do they wash up on the bank with current and waves, or do you think they get lost there? Well, they get lost, and then they get covered up, you know, because of the wave action, and then the wave action uncovers it again, and then you have to be at the right time at the right place. Yeah. So every time, you know, after it, the wind's blowing, you know, I check my shoreline. Because I, I hate glass in the water. Yeah. Oh, That's another one of my pet peeves. Yeah, stepping on that. Yeah. Well, first, first month I was there, I was out at Turkey Pass picking up trash, and people that were in from out of state. Kid goes in the water. What's the first thing he does? Steps on a damn rusty hook. Mm -hmm. And after that, I thought, no. So every day, every day, I'd go out there, and I'd have a couple five-gallon buckets, and I'd fill them suckers up. Okay? You know, I'd do that enough. You know, I'd get it all. But you don't. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. You'd get out there, and you'd have it spotless. Next day, next win. Like nothing ever, you know, you never did that, nothing. Hey, to get back to what we're here about, I'm not, I mean, you've been living there all these years since Kirsten went missing. Um, I, I'm curious about your your thoughts on what happened, who might be involved, that kind of thing. I don't know, to tell you the truth. Like I said, I didn't know. But one thing that's always bothered me, that she left the mom. Mm -hmm. She went to Jones, I guess, with her dad or something like that. I, you could have got me off out of my house. I mean, I know. What if she comes back, or you know, what if somebody makes a call, or you know, something mm -hmm. like that? I, there was no way I'd left that house. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that bothers me. Yeah. She so felt like she shouldn't have left, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever at any point over these years or, or back when it occurred um, have any knowledge of what happened or know no. who was involved? No. Or were you in any way involved? No. No. So you're not responsible no. for Kirsten's disappearance? No. Didn't play any part in that? No. Like I said, didn't know. Didn't have, like I said, I just barely, you know, see, might have seen her once, twice, mm -hmm. playing with the kids, but other than that, I didn't, I didn't know. What, just out of curiosity, what do you think the motivation was of whoever did this? I mean, why would this have happened? Well, Dan, I couldn't have told you, but after over the years, you know, and hearing the rumors and this and that and the other, it, me, it always boils down to drugs. You know, I heard that she was on meth and cocaine and, and Don's wife was the same thing. You know, she said, yeah, she had been over there, you know, that night. And they got lit up. So apparently she did get lit up because, 
You know, if somebody did come in, mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't you have heard it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, but I know that mean that she left Kirsten home alone, you think? Or? No, I don't know. I'm sure she did. But I don't know. Like I said, I didn't know. And I really didn't pay much attention to, to Don and his wife. It's just, duh. Uh, uh, where did they live? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Caddy Corner for me. Straight across the house. street? Not straight, just Caddy Corner. A little White House, Caddy Corner for me. Okay. And they had two or three kids. And I'd come home one day. I was rewarding myself. I did something. And I was stopped at uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Got me a family pack of chicken. I was going to go down. And the kids, whenever I walked up, they was just, the way they were eyeballing me, you know, like, they hadn't ate nothing. I mean, they were, really, if you'd have, if you'd have seen them, you'd have thought that, too, because, I mean, they were skinny. So I got me a piece of chicken, I was chewing on it, and they just, you want some chicken? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that all right that they can have this? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, no, it's not, no, it's something everybody do. When you got kids that are, you know. And I know he, he was a welder by trade, but he, you know, talking to him a time or two, you know, things weren't going right for him, and, you know, he didn't have money and all that. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have a problem, you know. Who were we talking about was a welder? Don. Don? Okay. Um, from looking back over the history, I, I understood that uh, Shannon's brother, I guess, stayed with you for Aaron, a short Aaron. time. Aaron, Aaron. Yeah, Aaron. Tell us about that. How did that happen? And <coughs> he was in the neighborhood, you know, he's looking, apparently looking for, you know, his niece. Mm -hmm. So I'm out there one day and he stops and he talks, you know anything, blah, 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 you know, and we just got to talking and, you know, he's living in a damn, you know, under a bridge and, dude, you know, I found out already that he, that night that he'd been locked up. You know, so he wasn't a suspect in my books. So, yeah, I opened my house to, you know, if you ain't got no, because I did that for anybody, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it's sick to say, but that's the kind of guy I am. So he needed a place to say, there's a couch, you know, you can trash here for a couple of days and, you know, try to do what you got to do to, you know, right. figure out what happened to your knees. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's, like y'all, that's serious. Sure, Absolutely. How, how long after Kirsten went missing did this happen? Was it like the same week? Was yeah, it probably in the same week. In the same week. Yeah. And then I can't. Long? I can't verify that because, like I said, that's that's been a while. Oh yeah. But yeah, it was probably about in the same week. How long did Aaron stay there with you? Uh, just a couple of days, and then you know he'd go off, and then he'd come back, and then I wound up having to just tell him he couldn't come back because I he was on meth too. Then at the time didn't know it. And, and I think, too, that because shit. you've you you've heard that Shannon was using drugs, too. I mean, I don't know for, for a fact, but that's what I heard. And it, I'll just say this. If you ever partied with them, if you knew they were doing drugs or witnessed it, just just tell us that. I don't know. We're, we're not. No. I don't. I, no. Like I said, there's, and you all know, you got people that do drugs, you got people that drink. And you don't do drink and you don't, you know, do, I drink. Yeah. But no, I never party with her. And yeah. I never party with Don and his wife. Okay. Now, did you know Aaron at all before? No. So you never met him, never talked to him no. before either? No. Did he ever confide in you anything about uh, the case or anything about Just Shannon? He couldn't, he couldn't clear his sister. We, we talked about had you ever been in the backyard, had you ever been in the house, all those things. And you said you hadn't. No, while well, they were there, no. Okay. Well, I don't. I don't believe you, oh. Tony. I don't think you're telling the whole truth. Okay. Your DNA is in the backyard the morning that she was discovered missing. Okay. And on her window, and on the panties she'd been wearing the night before that were recovered in the backyard. No. No, not me, because I was not, no, I find it far-fetched, but no, because I, I don't know, I didn't know him. And maybe you didn't know him, Tony, but we, and I didn't have no business over there at all. That may be also. What we need to talk about is what you were doing in that backyard that night and what happened. We need to get to the truth of I what I have no idea what you're talking about. 
Were you there trying to help Kirsten? No. Like I said, I didn't know anything about them people at all. Nothing. Nothing. Well, never met them. Never said hi, bye, nothing. Well, here's the here's our problem with that. Is how did your DNA get there? Then? Don't know. I mean, is it is this something that's gone on, Tony? That uh, is this one of those things from? 17 years ago, the uh, split-second decision has haunted you for 17 years? I don't know what you're talking about. Were you there to help her? No. Like I said, I don't. I have nothing to do with them people. Nothing. I didn't know them at all. Okay, so how did your DNA go? I have no idea. There. I have no idea. Tony, your blood is on her window. Your blood is on... Kirsten's panties. Okay. I don't see how that could happen. Well, it happens when you're injured in some way and your blood gets transferred to her window and those panties. Yeah, here's and it what gets I left think behind. Happened. I think you were there to help. No. I wasn't there, period. So how yeah. did your blood get there? I have no idea. Tony, you were there. This, this is scientific evidence. It's not a debate. It's not anything that can be argued. And, and here's the point where I really feel you're a good guy. I mean, you've worked 29 years at a hard job. You came up rough like I did. Came up poor. Yeah, but that's came beside the point. I had nothing to but, do with any of this. But here's the thing. I don't think you're, that was your intention. You're going to have to explain this. I if you were know there... How I do it. If you were there, <clears throat> if you were there because you heard her yelling for help from your backyard, and you go over there to see because you knew that she, her mother was a meth head and that she is probably at home alone, and you went over there to help, no. and you went to the backyard to avoid a conflict with the mother, and you was just going to take care of this no. little girl because just like you, growing up, you didn't want her being treated that way. That's, I mean, that's, that's how understandable things become. Yeah, I could understand that, but I don't. I don't understand how you get you, my DNA. Maybe, well, how, exactly. How is our, your blood? That's I have no idea. Well, I'm I wasn't you. there at all. We we weren't there either. All we have is this: the evidence that was collected. Mm. I didn't collect it. It was collected 17 years ago, Tony. But it's there. And we have to deal with this. And you're saying you were never there. No. There's no reason it was, should be there. No. It's not helping your cause. What's going to help your cause is to explain to us how it's there. I because the don't fact, have a clue. Because the fact it's there is the girl in the room. Now, there is a reasonable explanation as to why you were there, and you were there to help Kirsten. No. You were there for, you had a relationship with Shannon. No. Never knew her. You were there as a peeping Tom or something <laughs> oh. of this nature. No. Then, those are ex explainable. Yeah, I understand that, but I, I, no, never there. Never there. Never there. Can't give us any reason no. why your blood would be there. No. Tony, the worst thing you can do for yourself right now in this position is lie and not be truthful. I'm being truthful, dude. Well, I don't know how, I, don't, I can't explain that, why that, y'all are finding this. Well, your blood is in that backyard the morning that she's discovered missing, okay? This is your chance, Tony. I understand to that. Explain, but explain what that. happened. Maybe you didn't mean no, for whatever happened to happen. There. Or you, you were there. You were there. Was you in a depression? That. Was that a, t a period when you were going through a depression and drinking and getting depressed and you don't remember until later what no. actually occurred? I don't even think I was drinking that night. To tell you the truth, I might have been, but I don't think so. And I was in bed. And so I'm pretty sure I don't sleep well. This isn't a deal where you got drunk the night before and 
and actually went through with some urges you had? No. Whether you're attracted to little girls no. or whatever you're... Your I've never been be. attracted to little girls or little boys. Well, once again, how is your blood there? I don't know. Do you not do you not believe me when I tell you that we have your DNA? No, I don't. You, you don't believe me? Okay. And I I I can show you the Oh, I'm sure you could. It, that, that's what that but I don't I don't know how that could have happened. Yeah. Well there's I more, wasn't there. There's more to the story, Tony, and that's what we're hoping to get from you today. And this is your opportunity to be truthful and to take responsibility for whatever happened. Yeah, if I was responsible, that'd be different. Okay. Well, with that said, were you there and somebody else was there and actually took her and maybe you left I your DNA behind? I was not there. I'm not into little girls and I'm not a window peeper. Okay. Well, is there some other explanation for why you were in that backyard that night? I wasn't in that backyard. I don't know. I, my blood could have been there or what. I know I went to bed. I know when the dog woke me up, I didn't go out my back door. I let dog in and I went back to bed. Well, Tony, I, I don't know how to impress upon you any more than we've got the, the physical evidence there. And we have to deal with that, Tony. We really do. And we have to get to a point where we can explain that. I understand that. Well, help me do that. I wish I could. I don't know. I don't know what y'all are talking about. Okay. I don't sleepwalk. Tony, I think that uh, you've been living with this a long time. Living with what? With what happened. And I think that it's it's one of those things, Tony, where you're scared. And, but I think it's, there's some verses that says, you know, at some point, everything is known. And uh, I truly believe that. And uh, one of these days that you're going to have to come to realize that. And I don't, I think that your best bet is simply tell the truth. I've been telling the truth. Okay. Well. Unfortunately, what you're telling me doesn't align with any of the physical evidence that we have. And unless there's a huge conspiracy to the FBI and the OSBI and our officers from 17 years ago to frame you, we have to explain this. And I really think you're, you need to talk about it. Because I think that's the best thing for you to do is simply tell us the truth. I think you're going to feel better about it. You're going to have a weight lifted off your shoulders. I have no idea what you're talking about. I am, okay, you got somebody's blood, but I, not mine. I was not there. Okay. Not that night, not the night before, not the night after. Did someone talk you into doing something, going with them? No, I wouldn't do that. So how did, how do we explain your blood? I have no idea. Well, the blood's going to have to be explained, Tony. It's going to have to be. Yeah, I mean, it's, and I'm it's, trying to go in my head how, <coughs> how anything, or, but I, whenever she was living there, I didn't go there. I was there when William was there. Yeah. But, and even then, I don't, don't see how to cut myself on a, a, a window. Yeah. There, brother. I 
I don't know either. Okay. Well, I'm telling you that uh, the physical evidence is going to have to be explained. No disrespect. I get the impression maybe you don't believe me when I told you what I told you. So I want to just bring you the copy directly from OSBI, and we've highlighted it here for you. Okay. I just want you to understand that this isn't this isn't a bluff, Tony. You see those odds? Those odds. Um, I can just tell you from my years of experience, I've never seen at that level. Which means this is your DNA. Okay, this is your blood, Tony. That's Kirsten's panties that her mom identified that she had on that night, and that's where your blood was found, as well as on her window seal. So this isn't just a, and, and just so you'll know, we also located some blood on the fence picket, and it's still out for testing, but I suspect that there's a good chance that will come back to you. I can't explain that. And that's, that's what I want to give you an opportunity to do, is explain it, because it's scientific evidence. We know for a fact it's your blood. And of course, Tony, I don't have to tell you that when these paintings are identified as, as uh, Kirsten's, um, and Mom says, yeah, she was wearing those the night before, and the next morning at dawn, your blood is found in them at the back fence of the property. I mean, if you're in my position as the detective, what does that tell you? Uh, don't look good for me. Uh, <coughs> and I, you know, I just want to plead with you to be honest. I want to be honest. I want and you to I'm be doing honest. So honest. Yeah. I don't. You know, I mean, Tony, I think this has gone on for so many years and has been unsolved, uh, as you well know, for, for a long, long time. Um, and I'm sure you've told people countless times, I had nothing to do with it, I don't know anything about it, etc., etc. et cetera. But this isn't the time to keep saying the same old routine because this isn't going away. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, this is scientific, scientific evidence, Tony. That's your DNA. That's your cells from your body. Tell it. I mean, tell me what happened. How did you get injured? I'm trying to figure it out myself. What 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 all this is about? I mean, you were you were in in some way injured for your blood to be on her window and for your blood to be in her panties. Mike, what I want to know from you, was there some kind of a dispute between you and Kirsten? I had no dealings with those people. Didn't know nothing about them. I believe that. I believe that. But I also believe that this is your DNA on her window seal and your DNA on her panties in the backyard. I don't doubt that you didn't know them. But that didn't take this away. This isn't going anywhere. And we've got to get to the truth of the matter. I mean, for you to sit here and say, I've never been in that backyard and I wasn't there, it's a lie, Tony. Yeah, that's not the truth. Saying, yeah. it, it's not the truth. And i got to believe, if I can speak frankly, you seem like a good guy. And I, I know if I'd made a mistake like that, and we all make mistakes, we're all sinners, but I gotta believe this has been bugging you for your entire life since it happened. Right. So you're telling me what happened that morning or that night hadn't been bothering you all these years. That's not me. I don't. Was I, that was that the alcohol or were you experimenting with no, uh, something I else? I don't do night? drugs, and I don't know. I don't know. I I still trying to fathom in my mind what blood. My blood. Yeah. I was nowhere around there. Didn't know them people. Didn't have no dealings with them people. Didn't care about them people. Tony, this, this is your I understand. Okay. okay. I, I, you can sit here and say that same crap over and over. You and I both know that's not the truth. No. It's, it's, the truth will have to come out. I don't understand this. The truth is what needs to come out. Yeah. And you're the only person that can do that. You're the only person that can bring 
Kirsten back and let her family have a proper burial for her. You're the person that can help do that. You made a mistake, Tony. Okay, you made a huge mistake. Do what's right now. Take responsibility for what happened and help us get Kirsten back. I can't help you. I don't know. I don't understand. You said that's not me, and when, and when somebody says that to me, what it says is that's not, I, I, I wasn't in my right mind. I was no. under the influence. <laughs> not in the influence. Like I said, if I had a beer, I might have had two. I went to bed. I always go to bed. I'm a 10 o'clock bedtime guy. The only reasons here lately I haven't been going to sleep is because I have to have a treatment. And I wake up every two and a half hours, three hours, take treatment, go back to sleep. I have nothing bothering me other than breathing problems. So your conscience hasn't been bothering you for all these years? No. Let me ask you this. Your wife told us that every year on Kirsten's anniversary that you're upset about it, that you go through a phase of being depressed and upset about it. <sighs> and the reason that is, it's on the news, and yeah, how do you feel about it? Well, yeah, I'm going to be upset. I mean, it's a missing child. Good. If you want to carry it to your grave and not do what's right, that's on you. But you need to think about what you're doing because right now, these yeah, decisions you're about making. How's my damn blood or me? Because I was not there. And I know on that night I was in my same mind. We need to figure this out. Yeah, you do. But you're, you're my key. You're a loved one that can help me, Tony. I want you to help me. If I could, I would, because it's making me look real bad. Well, yeah. Well, I'm not going to hear, I'm not going to you. I'm not going to be mean or anything, but I, I, I need the truth. I need. I, 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 need to, I need the truth, too. I need to find her. I need to find Kirsten. Help me find her. I can't help you. Was there somebody else involved? I can't help you on that either. I No, I didn't help anybody or help myself take this girl. Then how do you explain the ball? I don't. Well, I can't. You got a, let me see your arm. You have a scar on your arm. What happened there? I was picking up a toilet bowl and it cracked. When was that? Last year. Hey, hey, I'm in the room. I'm Major David Huff. I'm, 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 like, I'm like, I'm pretty much these guys' boss. Um, the guys have been out there kind of talking to me about the interview. Um, what do you say? Let's, let's take a break for just a minute. I don't want you getting upset at us. We really are trying to get to the truth. But I don't want you getting upset with us. If you take a drink of water, we'll just relax for a minute, okay? I don't, I can't, I can't explain this. And the only thing that I'm thinking right now is, yeah, I'm being set up because we want to close this case. That's the only thing that's coming in my head right now. Seriously. Okay. Well, um, I understand what you're saying. I'm going to be honest with you. When this first stuff, the stuff first came out, um, the DNA, I, I want you to understand how it works because not everybody does this, so it wouldn't be uncommon for you not to know. Uh, the normal person that doesn't do police work doesn't know. The DNA that we got off of these panties, that was taken all the way back when it happened, okay? And it was put into a container where we could keep it indefinitely, all right? Um, it's been there ever since the FBI ticket, um, when they were helping us, it was there, okay? 
we had what was called an unknown DNA sample. We knew that it was human DNA. We can tell that. Astra. Oh, we have to think. We knew that it was human DNA, okay? Um, and we knew it was human DNA from a male. We can know that. What we don't know, when we got it back then, we didn't know the name attached to it. We didn't know whose DNA that was, okay? When the FBI and Detective Miller went out and got those swabs, okay, got them, they got them from a bunch of people, all right? You being one of them. Then it was tested against a sample that was taken off the windowsill and off of the panties, which, by the way, I don't know if they told you this or not, but also has Kirsten's DNA on it. Because little kids, they do a little pee pee in their pants and skid marks. So her DNA's on it, your DNA's on it, and it's also on the windowsill. That was all done way back when this all happened. It's just now that the DNA um, results have come back. And I don't know if they told you this. You seem like an intelligent man. So to help you comprehend what we're talking about when we say we know this to be a fact, the number sextillion, what this is saying, if you take a one and you put 21 zeros behind it, yeah, it's, it's, it's yours. Um, <coughs> any Anybody in the world, any scientist is going to say that that is your blood. Now, obviously when we have a case like this, we're not going to, Mr. Palmer, we're not going to lay out everything that we know and everything we have. Um, that's just not the way it works. It'd be counterproductive. Um, we're not going to do it. There's more than this, but we want to try to get you to digest, kind of digest one thing at a time. Now, having said that, um, do we know all the circumstances surrounding what happened that night? We don't. Um, only, only God, the person who did it, and Kirsten probably know that. But I'm going to tell you this. We do know that Kirsten was wearing those that night. We do know that your blood's on there and her DNA's on there. And that is just an absolute fact. Right. Yeah, I understand that. Um, and I, I tell you, you know, just listening and talking to you, um, you know, 17, 18 years now has passed. Um, I'm going on my 25th year here. Um, I worked every case you could probably imagine. Um, so is Detective Miller, like he was telling you. Um, we're not brilliant men by any stretch of the imagination, but when it comes to this stuff, um, we're, we're pretty darn smart. And this is what it boils down to. Um, this much time can pass, and if something horrible happens in your life that you don't want to remember, you can put it in a little box and put it out here and try to keep it away from you. Um, but it happens. Um, I've had to put horrible things that have happened in my life and put it in a little box out here and just hope that it goes away and that pray that one day it doesn't come out. Because I've seen some, some terrible things. I can imagine. And here's what I think. And... You know, what I think may not matter to you, but it's from the heart. Um, this is what I think. I think that you're not an evil person. I don't think you're an evil person. I've heard about your work history. Uh, you know, I know all that stuff. I know you're a dependable person, a hardworking man. I think on this one night, this one time, for whatever reason, that some demon inside you, you made a mistake. We need your help. Can you have another one? Mm -hmm. I do. I smoke three packs a day. More fortunate for me. I, 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 if I could help you, I would help you. Well, but I don't like you sitting in this situation. I don't. 
don't like this. Don't, this don't look good at the, for me at all. No. And I've, I've done research on, you know, what happened at, when using Walters and stuff like that. And I've uh, listened to part of the interview, you know, here this morning. And is there a chance that maybe you blacked out and did it? That you went over and did something? You said you said something about you don't think you sleepwalk. No. I'm just going through scenarios. Well, what it, what it comes down to is this. You know, we've had a lot of people in this room and interviewed a lot of people about stuff similar to this, unfortunately. And there's two kinds of people we deal with. There's the people that when we prevent, pre present the evidence that we got and they know that they've been um, found out, um, they stand up and take some type of responsibility and move on uh, or they deny it. And to me, um, that's the folks that are really evil. And I just didn't get the feeling that that was you. But I guess I could be wrong. It wouldn't be the first time. And I'm still sitting here thinking, April's full. Y'all come up with April full. Because that's... No. I'm not something this serious. No, there's no, there's no April full. Where, where, where do you think, if, if someone was to... If someone, the person that did do this, where would they take her and dump her at? Or if they would. Couldn't tell you. I mean, I watch all the cop shows and stuff like that, or what I do watch, and there's there's no telling. So you bring up cop shows, so I'm sure you... My wife likes cop shows. Yeah, you've watched a lot of yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. so, you know, and most of the... This, classes and all the research and stuff I've done with, you know, missing children, where they're usually located at, they're located, you know, or the suspect lives two doors down, three doors down, or in the same neighborhood, you know, so, I mean, you've hit the profile, you know, your past history shows that, you know, but... That's a little strike against me. No, but like I said, <clears throat> people change, Tony. People change. He's talking about your home life, how you grew up. I grew up with a single mom that raised nine kids by herself, and I'm about the only one out. Of, I'm about the only one out of my family that that's graduated school, that has a successful job. Oh, I'm, you know, people tell me you can't do that. You're a piece of crap. Yeah, and I showed them that. No, that right. It's not about anything like that. I was. Not sexually molested or abused. I was hated, but I found good in this. You know, he taught me some shit, and that's helped me, you know, go through my life. I know some stuff. I know carpentry. I know mechanics. You know, yeah. I trust him to, to this day because he hated me. Yeah. But Jack of all trades. That didn't, that didn't turn me into a monster. Right. And I, don't think I was hated. Yeah, and I, I don't think you're a monster. I think this is just one time something happened and it went a little too far and something had to, you know. And actually, actually I'm in shock is what I am. Like I said, I am still thinking y'all going to say, yeah, well, but this is just a, a joke, or not a joke, but trying to get me to say uh, something or... I'm not, I'm not here to lie. I'm not lying to you about anything. Um, like I told you from the get-go, you know, my job was to investigate this case and to go out. And I guarantee you, there were probably 30, 40 people that I went out and I got swabs from, just like you on that day. I'm shocked. I don't know what to say. Well, you're, Tony, you're the last person, to, you're the last person to touch her. You're the last person that's to, to touch right her. That's her, that's her paintings. You're, you're the absolute last person that touched Kirsten. 
Um, that with other things that we have and that we know and that we've learned. Um, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. This guy especially has been pushing to allow uh, him to be able to talk to you and, and try to make some sense about it and give you an opportunity to tell the truth. I was, heck, I was kind of against it, to be honest with you, um, because that you don't get that kind of scientific evidence every day. That is absolutely the most okay. astronomical thing that you could imagine. It's about like every grain of sand on the, the whole planet Earth um, are the odds that it's not you that were the last person that touched your panties. That was the last person that went through that window. The, the odds are, they're uh, uncomprehendable. So is that, is that the way it's going to be, Tony? Is it going to be, is it going to be a deal where to, till the day you die, you're going to, uh, uh, proclaim our innocence? Yeah. Everything that we were going to do here today and everything that you were going to tell us is going to go into a report. Um, it could either be a report saying that, um, he manned up and had some remorse or it can be that it's that evil person that we were afraid of. And that's up to you. That is told that ball is totally in your court, but it's going to read one way or another, and that's up to you, because it goes from us to the district attorney and then to the court. So it can it can read how you want, but giving you this opportunity that was this gentleman's idea, and um, and I gave him that opportunity, and I'll be able to go home and sleep tight tonight, knowing that I gave you that shot. And if you don't want to take that shot, then that's fine. Um, I, I can't force you to, Tony. All, all we want is the truth. And all, all we want I is to, to finally be able to let a mother bury her child. That's what we want. Properly. I know y'all really think I'm guilty, but I know I'm not. So I don't. I don't know what else to tell you, Tony. I'm, I'm still in shock. I don't. I, I, I know you're in shock. Doesn't Tony, compute because because it's been 17 years and you thought it was over. That's why you're in shock. No, what I'm in shock about is you got my blood. Yeah. How's that possible? I I can't tell you that, but I can tell you that it is absolute. It is absolute. There is no maybe. There is no. There's a possibility. It is absolutely one hundred percent. Do you, do you have any more? Do you have any more sh to smoke? Not yet. Well, go ahead. Go ahead and smoke for a minute. Let us go out here and talk. We'll get your head together. We'll give you one more opportunity to to think about what I just said. Okay. you understand too and you probably already know this you're not leaving this room down. I understand that and you understand that it's probably going to be quite a while that you're going to spend in jail just because we don't have a body doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to charge you with anything 
I've got enough evidence against you. But go ahead. Tell me there's there's an arrest warrant in that deal signed by a judge and it's for murder. And judges don't sign that unless there's probable cause. And to be fair to you, okay, to be fair to you, um you're not going anywhere. You're you're being charged with murder. And here's the deal I want you to remember. Um right now we're interviewing every one of your family members. You can probably hear it in the next room. We're already at your house. We will have back hose, ground penetrating sonar, cadaver dogs, the whole nine yards. Oh. We was laughing about that yesterday. What's so funny about that? that if y'all were to ever go in our backyard, well, I got dogs and cats and pets everywhere in that backyard. <clears throat> I don't know what the hell we was laughing about that. We was watching something on TV. Like where you bury them? Or animals, yeah. Well, well, so we're not going to find, and, and this is your opportunity because, I mean. You ain't going to find Kirsten Hatfield in my backyard. Or on your property anywhere. No. Where do I find her? I don't know. Did you black out and you took her somewhere and dumped her? I didn't get her. Who did? Well, what we're going to do is we're just going to, we're going to leave it with, um, you're that person that has no remorse, and that's the way the report's going to read. Okay. Because what I'm seeing from you is you could care less if we ever find her, and yeah, I did. you okay. could care less. Just put your cigarette out for me. Turn around for me. Put your hand behind your back. Following the arrest and as court documents began to be put together, it was suggested that Kirsten may have been targeted by Palmer for predatory reasons, and investigators believed that Palmer had been motivated to remain in the same home. This was to potentially conceal evidence of the crime or the location of Kirsten's body. In an effort to bring closure to the long-standing mystery, officers decided to employ sonar equipment to reopen the search for Kirsten. Now they focused on Palmer's residence. I've done over 50 cases. I think we've recovered in the neighborhood of a little over 40 people. And that's just in the past eight years. Kent Beeler is helping Midwest City Police identify what's buried on this property on Jet Drive. That's him crawling out from underneath the house. In this particular case, we are looking for an eight-year-old child, and of course that makes for a very, very small person. And so the, the more time that goes by, the more difficult it is. The OU professor says even with a ground penetrating radar and a backhoe, it's a huge undertaking. We're in an urban environment in a backyard. Uh, we have utility lines running all over the place. People dig all, all kinds of holes in their backyard for all kinds of reasons. Having looked at the soil and vegetation on the property, he says even after 18 years, remains can still be located if they're here. Unfortunately, this search yet again yielded no results, but due to the DNA evidence, Palmer was still formally charged with Kirsten's homicide. As he awaited trial in prison, Palmer made an attempt on his own life. However, the injuries incurred were not life-threatening. He was subsequently put on watch so that Kirsten's family could finally gain some type of relief from their suffering. After years of searching for justice, they would not let it slip through their fingers. The trial of Tony Palmer for the homicide of Kirsten Hatfield took place in October of 2017. There, Palmer entered a plea of not guilty in his involvement with Kirsten's disappearance. During the trial, one of Kirsten's school friends testified. They revealed that Palmer had made her and Kirsten uncomfortable. They said this was due to his persistent staring as they played outside. Prosecutors also raised concerns about potential links between Palmer and other assaults. Three women told the judge they believe Anthony Palmer sexually assaulted them. Now, this happened years ago, so for many of them, talking about it today was very emotional. Anthony, what do you have to say about what these women claim? 
Anthony Palma said nothing. Are these women telling the truth? About the claims the women made against him. Prosecutors want to show that he has a history of sexual related crimes and breaking into homes. He's charged with murder. Prosecutors claim the only reason he targeted Kirsten Hatfield was to sexually assault her. When I was told what he had done, how he had went through the little girl's bedroom window, that just brought everything back, everything that he had done to me. This witness told the judge she only came forward with her story after hearing how similar her incident was with what happened to Hatfield. Another told the judge Palma broke into her house and brutally attacked her in her bedroom while her children were in the house. In one disturbing incident in the late 1970s, Palmer entered his girlfriend's home through a bedroom window and, in the middle of the night, he preyed on his girlfriend's then eight-year-old sister. In a separate case that occurred the year following Kirsten's abduction, Palmer gave his 17-year-old roommate illicit substances without her knowledge. The victim recalled being found without clothing in a bathtub, with Palmer pouring water on her and preying on her with an implement. These stories mounted evidence against Palmer, building a picture of the likelihood to commit a crime of this nature against Kirsten, speaking to his character as a predator. The most damning evidence against Palmer was a DNA evidence presented in court. This left no doubt about his involvement in Kirsten's abduction and homicide. The jury wasted little time and deliberated for just over an hour before reaching a guilty verdict. Emotions were high this afternoon as that guilty verdict was read. Kirsten Hatfield's family has waited for more than 20 years for some answers in this case. As for Anthony Palma, he was silent as he was led back to jail and I asked him questions. Any thoughts on the verdict? Can you say where her body is? As you can see, Palma looked straight ahead and when that verdict was read, he showed no emotion and did not look at the family. The jury heard testimony from witnesses throughout the week, including three women who say they were assaulted by Palma in the 1980s and 90s, but the biggest evidence against him, his DNA was found on a pair of Kirsten Hatfield's panties. Those panties were found in the backyard of the family's home the day Kirsten disappeared on May 14, 1997. Kirsten's remains have never been found, but prosecutor Scott Rowland is hopeful they will find them someday. We'll continue looking for her until we find her remains or until this man's heart softens enough so that he sees fit to at least let us recover Kirsten's remains. So far, we haven't seen any kind of remorse or any kind of movement in that regard. Kirsten's mother, Shannon, and her sister, Faith, also broke down in tears when that verdict was read, and they told me this afternoon this is a moment they weren't sure would ever come. We are just, um, I, I can't explain it, but we are just floored by this miracle, and we are so thankful. Palma's next court date is November 27th. Outside the courtroom, Kirsten's mother expressed her relief and gratitude for the outcome. She was overwhelmed by the verdict. She saw it as a miracle that restored her faith in the criminal justice system. Shannon thanked all the men and women involved in bringing integrity to a case that even after all these years had always held a glimmer of hope. Following the trial, Anthony Palmer was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. However, his time in prison was cut short. We are following today the man convicted of abducting and killing eight-year-old Kirsten Hatfield, 22 years ago, is dead. Over the weekend, DOC confirmed Anthony Palma was killed at the state pen in McAllister Friday. News 9's Chris Gilmore has reaction from Kirsten's family and law enforcement who investigated the case. Chris. Good morning, Anthony Palma was serving a life sentence without parole when he was killed in his cell on Friday, allegedly by one of his cellmates at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister. Now, the cellmate of his, a man serving multiple life sentences for a murder conviction of his own, the news of Palma's death at a maximum security facility has left some asking questions. In January of 2019, less than two years into his life sentence, Palmer was found lifeless in his prison cell at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. He had been throttled and beaten by his cellmate, Raymond Pilado. He was serving a sentence for a triple homicide that he had committed in 2010. Prison officials believed that Palmer was targeted by his cellmate due to the nature of his crime. This resulted in him being attacked with an extension cord. It was common for predators to receive extremely negative, violent treatment from other inmates in prisons. 
and this was no different. Tragically, with his passing, the location of Kirsten's body, which he had concealed for years, was taken to the grave with him. Midwest City detectives had been planning to visit him in prison later that year. They had hopes that he would reveal the location of Kirsten Hatfield's body. The police chief expressed that Palmer might have had a change of heart, a change which would lead him to finally disclose what he had done with Kirsten's body. However, that hope was never realised. The police chief said that they didn't encourage what had happened in prison, but that some people would say that Palmer received justice for his crimes. The police force's primary concern was the fact that they had not found closure in Kirsten's case, and the chances of locating her body grew extremely slim without Palmer. Police Chief Klaibs discussed his curiosity about the events surrounding Kirsten's disappearance. Thinking that Palmer may have confided in someone about what he had done, he encouraged the public to come forward with any information they might have, anything at all regarding any conversations they may have had with Tony Palmer about Kirsten. Mother Shannon also shared her perspective on Anthony Palmer's arrest and the subsequent events. Shannon emphasised that even though Anthony Palmer had taken her daughter's life, she had forgiven him long before discovering that he was responsible for Kirsten's passing. I will never give up on her. The news coming to Shannon in a phone call from family. Her daughter's killer found dead inside of his cell. I didn't anticipate having so many different emotions. I mean, forgiveness and God and a prayer life and fighting for Anthony Palma um, in prayer. She was hoping time in prison would soften Palma into confessing where he hid Kirsten's body, so she wrote him letters. Until Anthony Palma asked that I stop writing him. Very respectful, but he asked that I just stop writing him. Was there any part of you that felt this is revenge. No, no, no. I, I'm not celebrating Anthony Palmer's death. Um, I know, I know that for certain. She expressed that God's love and forgiveness were essential in helping them navigate Palmer's arrest, the trial, and whatever comes next. She clarified that she wasn't celebrating Palmer's passing, and she extended her prayers to his family, acknowledging that he also had loved ones who cared for him. Kirsten's family is determined to continue looking for her, hoping that investigators search a lake where Anthony Palmer used to work, and that they may uncover evidence related to their daughter's disappearance. However, with Palmer's passing, they too are concerned that the investigation into their daughter's case may lose momentum. Kirsten's mother worries that Palmer's passing might lead to complacency, potentially affecting the efforts to investigate him for any other involvement in missing persons cases. She feels that Kirsten's value is not receiving the attention it deserves, and she seeks prayers, insights, connections and opportunities to shed light on the darkness that continues to surround her daughter's case. While she maintains faith that God will bring Kirsten's case to a conclusion, she continues to wonder how that will happen without properly saying goodbye. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.